Just before we begin, would you mind giving our guests a brief background on who you are, and then we can dive into our discussion. Sure. I'm Bob Bush. I'm an endocrinologist in Albany, New York. I'm director of clinical research at the Albany Med Community Endocrine Group. We're a 15 endocrine group provider. We've done clinical research trials probably for about 20 years, and I'm a practicing endocrinologist and see patients every day. And teach right, pharmacy, thank you. Um, pharmacy students, med students, et cetera, as part of it. Of what we do. All right, thank you for that. And now uh, the discussion Dr. Bush and I will be having is related to endocrinology and the diabetes care as a whole. Uh, right now, it's a very exciting time. We just got past ADA 2020. Well, technically we have a little bit left of ADA 2020, but even before ADA 2020, we've been learning a lot about diabetes care recently and a lot about the newest agents that are involved in diabetes care. I think the first and most prominent class we have to talk about is the SGLT2 inhibitors. What do you think is the most exciting part about this class right now? And do you see them catching on the way that a lot of people think that they should in clinical practice moving forward? So in thinking about the SGLT2s, which we've had available for now for about five years, if I thought back to when I was a fellow and I told my chief of endocrine, we would have a pill that would lower A1C weight and blood pressure without causing hypoglycemia. And oh, by the way, it will treat and prevent heart failure, uh, prevent end-stage kidney disease, and lower MI stroke and death, each individual component and death, you know, as a summation of all the outcomes of all the SGL2s, he would have fired me from the program for hallucinating. And to have a class of drug like this where you could benefit the patient, it's almost like you have to find a reason not to use it, not to use it. You have to prove you don't need this drug. And you know, every time you turn around, there's a new outcome study. So that's the fun part of going to work is you could upgrade a patient's care from what they're on to one better. If it were just for the weight loss and lowering blood pressure and lowering A1C without hypoglycemia, that would have been enough. And then you end up with Empereg showing lowest cardiac death and MACE, and even heart failure in Empereg, although that wasn't the primary endpoint. And then you have, you know, same thing verified in Canvas, and, and, and pretty much. And then you have Credence that lowers end-stage renal disease and lowers the GFR down to 30. Then you have DAPA CKD that isn't out yet, but lowers the GFR down to 25 in diabetics and non-diabetics. And we'll see what the overall results of that. And then you have, you know, Declare to prevent heart failure in a multi-risk patient. And then you have DAPA heart failure, you know, with HEFREF in diabetics and non-diabetics to prevent heart failure hospitalizations and death. I mean, that's a lot of stuff in, in five short years. And that's a lot of outcome stuff that has been out with this class of drug. But unfortunately, our peers still love DPP-4s you and know, our peers in primary care uh, still love DPP-4s, even with no cardiac benefit because it's open mouth insert pill versus with an SGLT2, it does take some time with the discussion for the patient, you know, lowering the thiazide or lowering the loop diuretic, getting rid of the thiazide or lowering the loop diuretic. Are they, is, un, is it an uncircumcised man or a woman with a lot of yeast infections? Um, tapering the insulin of the self. Are those are the kind of things, stopping if you can't eat or drink to avoid ketoacidosis. So that, that discussion with the patient takes a little time versus with the DPP-4, a lot of my colleagues call it open mouth insert pill, you're done, but you get what you pay for. You know, you get weight neutral, not weight loss. You don't get blood pressure lowering. You don't get all these great outcomes that you have with the SGLT2 class. So I think as people get more accustomed to using them, I think it will snowball and exponentially grow. I know a lot of my peers use them all the time. They're in our guidelines and these outcome studies are so exciting, but not everyone uses them. I even had, there was a clinician in my own practice with 15 of us who didn't use them, which was great for me because I would recruit his patients into our clinical trials. Those are the patients I put into Credence and DAPA CKD and some of the other studies because that clinician didn't use the SGLT2s. It wasn't my job to orient him. So that's basically you know, how, how uh, I see things with that. Thank you for that, that was great. Now, the other big uh, agent when it comes to treating patients with diabetes is GLP-1s. 
um, with all the news coming out about SGLT2s, especially with the cardiovascular benefits and the renal benefits that are seen with a lot of them, GLP-1s have sort of taken a back seat. Uh, but for a lot of clinicians and a lot of research suggests that they still may be able to achieve lower A1C or weight loss targets better than some SGLT2s. Where do GLP-1s fit in treatment algorithms now that SGLT2s have really begun to gain steam and are really taking center stage? So it's like you, you love your son and your daughter and you lo love both kids. So how are you going to choose which one you want to take on the trip? Well, guess what? You can take both of them with you. So, you know, if you want to give away all the secrets of what we endocrinologists do, it's GLP-1 and SGLT-2, whichever batting order you want to go into. I know ACE guidelines are GLP-1 first, but, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to give a pill than a shot. Not that easy. We have no fear of giving a weekly dose of a medicine, and now even GLP-1s come in pills as well, although with some hassle factor, but, you know, doable. But the bottom line is, if you, if you start one, you're going with the other as your next choice. You're starting the other, go one. Well, the big decision is, which am I going to give to the patient? So contrasting them, both have cardiac outcomes, right? We have rewind that's even in primary prevention and secondary, and lowering of stroke drove rewind, sustained six, lowering MI stroke death 26% and lowering stroke 39%. Uh, so you have those two outcomes, even in harmony with albiglutide, which is not on the US market. And Excel almost made it, probably because it was an SGLT2 balance in the placebo group that made the placebo look too good. Otherwise, Excel may have made it as well. But the bottom line is, you know, you have someone with, I guess the guidelines are if you're pre predominantly ASCVD, you can go with the GLP-1, although the SGLT-2 is fine there too. If you have heart failure or renal, then the SGLT-2, although there's good data with GLP-1s that they may benefit the kidneys as well. And you may know that uh, semaglutide is doing the FLOW trial, which is very similar to Credence, looking to get similar label to what Credence has. So we'll see down the line, maybe both will protect kidneys by different mechanisms and both will protect heart by different mechanisms. The SGLT2 works so quickly. I think the separation in DAPA heart failure was in the first 20 something days. Some people feel as soon as you e-scribe the SGLT2, the patient has benefit. I think it takes a little longer. They have to actually put it in their mouth and take it for a couple of weeks. But you know, the separation of the curves are quite early with SGLT2s, whereas GLP1s, it's more an anti-atherosclerotic effect. So that takes a little longer. But the bottom line is we have great drugs. They both, both classes cause weight loss. Both classes lose a lower A1C well. When they're compared head to head, you know, I know there are head-to-head -head studies and you like to feature one versus the other, but you use them together anyway. So it's sort of, you know, I like it when the pharma companies talk, oh, oh you know, this one beats this one in the head-to-head -head study. And maybe there's a little more weight loss in this one, a little better A1C in this one. Bottom line, you can use both of them. So, you know, and they complement each other very nicely. And as you know, on ominous octet, I mean, you're getting alpha cell, beta cell, gut, brain with GLP-1 and kidney with SGLT-2, and you can fill in the rest with you know, metformin and a low-dose TZD and get eight out of eight. So... You know, that's what our day is, day in, day out. However, you know, we, we may be preaching to the choir here. It depends who's listening to this. If it's, you know, primary care still loves MET, they still inappropriately love SELF, and they inappropriately love DPP-4. At least DPP-4 is a little safer because you don't get hypoglycemia, but you're not getting the cardiac or renal benefits that SGLT2 has or the renal benefit, the cardiac benefits of GLP-1. So that... That's what makes work fun, going into work and upgrading their regimen to these other drugs. And you know, you're, we, we get all the hugs. Primary care should get the hugs. Why would we want to get the hugs in their patients? You know, it, it makes us look too good, we'll put it that way, when you use them appropriately. Thank you for that. It's definitely a really exciting time. And it's incredible to think that we're still just sort of scratching the surface of what we know about both of these classes as a whole. And now, while these two classes dominate the discussion when it comes to endocrinology and cardiometabolic health now, there's sort of, I guess you could call them two oddballs, but they're not really oddballs. They're both pretty significant. Um, you have icosafe and ethyl, and then we have benpidoic acid, which both are sort of finding their role in treatment algorithms. Now, I know you were involved with Reduce It. We just got new Reduce It diabetes uh, information from ADA 2020. 
I was just curious, I know you came out last year and said that you were prescribing Reduce It to hundreds of patients at ADA 2019. What kind of added benefit are you seeing from Reduce It in your patients in real world situations versus what we're seeing in the Reduce It analyses that keep coming out? Well, as you know, the outcomes were low, you know, five point MACE and three point MACE, MI stroke, death, revascularization, and hospitalization for unstable angina. So, what am I seeing is they're coming back to me as outpatients. They're alive, they're not having strokes, and they feel very good about it. What's particularly good, not that I love drug company advertising on TV, but when the patient sees the drug they're on on TV featuring the benefits, it's sort of like it makes, it gives you more credence as a prescriber that they're seeing that. And it's a pretty clean drug in terms of side effect profile. But the thing it means is when we walk in an exam room with someone with diabetes, it used to be, you know, fix the A1C, where's your statin, where's your ass blocker? And now, you know, get the LDL as low as possible. And we have great statins and PCSK9s. And as you said, benfodoic acid and azetamide. You have plenty of ways you can get LDL down. There's no reason the LDL should be high with all the tools we have. But then you have to look at triglycerides. It's your obligation. If those triglycerides are higher than 150, prove that you don't need Vesepa. Remember, in the study, you had to have diabetes and risk factors. Well, that's anyone with diabetes who's walking in our office. And if you have diabetes and heart disease, well, there's your big ticket item. What we just, you know, what was just shown in the that sub study that was just uh, announced yesterday, the other day was dramatic benefit in those patients, but even the diabetic, the multi-risk factor diabetic. I think the key is that triglycerides are not just to be forgotten. It's not just an LDL world. And then also look at triglycerides. So you're fixing eight. It used to be the ABCs, right? A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol, but now look at triglycerides. And that's an indicator of persistent or residual cardiac risk that you could do something for by adding uh, icosafent ethyl to what the patients are. And remember, these are a lot of drugs. You already mentioned they're on SGLT2, they're on GLP-1, they're on metformin, they're on a RAS, they're on a statin, maybe on stuff beyond the statin. Now they're on icosafent ethyl. That's just their diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. You know, they may be on an antidepressant, they may be on a PPI. Sometimes you ask our patients, what do you have for breakfast? Pills, that's their answer pills. That's what they have in the morning. But these are life-sustaining meds, and each one can do one better than, they, than you did before. So that's the fun I personally have in medicine, to do one better than I did the visit before. What, what's, what new outcome data is there that I can prescribe for the patient that's tolerated by the patient, that's affordable to the patient? And fortunately, with commercial insurance, most of these drugs have vouchers, and most of them you can get them prescribable with uh, if you need prior auths. A lot of our patients don't need prior auths for some of these drugs. So we're, we're, I'm fortunate where I practice because I can get the drug that is affordable into the patient.